So I'll sort of try and uh, go over this somewhat slowly uh, because it's 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 a uh, introduction with many things that are happening in the volume which I've just finished editing and submitting the manuscript off to Oxford University Press. But it also brings together some of the concerns I have uh, in the area of language politics and translation for some time. So it sort of brings together some of these concerns at least over the last eight to ten years and also uh, some of the questions I have asked in my work but also bringing together certain other scholars which, which are not really classically translation study scholars. They mm -hmm. fall into sort of other, there are historians, there are philosophers and so on and so forth. So one of the sort of nagging things for me for past some years has been to understand what does multilingualism mean. And I'm not sort of very happy with the way multilingualism sort of gets described, gets sort of uh, uh, seen as almost, and I'm, I would be speaking largely of a South Asian context. You might find some things that overlap with the rest of the world, some may not, but we will look into that later. Uh, so I'm, I've not been sort of happy with the way uh, people sort of talk about multilingualism, even in the Indian context and so on, almost as if these were neatly displayed little pockets of different languages, like isomorphs that are, so you've got a Gujarati here, you've got a Hindi here, you've got a Marathi here, and so on, and almost as if their interrelations uh, and their crisscrossings are not already constitutive of translation. So translation is seen as a certain kind of a consequential uh, event that might take place when these languages interact with each other or when, they are, when there are translators who play this benign role of taking something from one language into another, assuming that each of this language is in itself already a stable and a bordered and a closed kind of entity. Uh, and so there are linguists who will work on language and there are translators who sort of assume that the language is an already given institution and their job really begins to say that I translate from Gujarati or I translate from Hindi or Odia. But the question of what is Gujarati and what is Hindi and what is Odia and what might be processes of uh, multiple registers and code switching and various other languages that hide behind the so-called one language. So to me, multilingualism is not only what is evident in the way dif a listing of different languages in the Constitution's eighth schedule and so on, or in, but also it, it, is, it is inherent in the everyday forms of communication. So I'm sort of complicating the institution of language and multilingualism, and in the process, I also foreground the instability and the protean nature of the source, right? What is called the source in translation studies. And so really speaking, this volume is, it's, I sort of sent out my conceptual note to potential contributors was to say, I want to reflect upon the idea of source in translation studies. So for instance, when you say Rita Kothari translates from Sindhi, uh, what does that mean? Almost as if to say that Sindhi is uh, a stable and a fully closed kind of entity. But there are certain, what came to be codified as Sindhi hides many other stories behind it, right? Which unfold sometimes in the act of translation, but it doesn't get captured, I think, in the larger conceptualization of translation studies. So these are some of the concerns, and I uh, will begin the essay wherever it says the anthology or the book. I'm referring to the book, Multilingual Nation, and I'm drawing from various people, but let me sort of, so I don't call this an introduction in the book. It's the first essay the book opens with, and I say, and I'm using the, I'm using mul not multilingualism as a noun, I'm using it as a verb, almost to sort of say we need to move away from the sedateness of the verb and of the noun and make it an active verb to understand how do you multilingual rather than multilingualism is and there. So I call it when we multilingual do we translate. Uh, and I begin by quoting Derrida who says when I said that the only language I speak is not mine I did not say it was foreign to me. That is a difference. And so I, I, uh, allow me to begin the essay. A panel discussion on translation in the year 2015 has persisted in my mind as an example 
of a missing connection between translation and language dynamics in India. At the Goa Arts and Literature Festival, a panel on translation began with the moderator asking each translator panelist who quote-unquote represented a language in India to relate her experience of translating. Interestingly, another panel on which was called Language Battles in India was held the following day, represented again by specific language translators, linguists, thinkers to comment on the acrimonious debates taking place between languages. The two panels operated entirely independently of each other with no reference of one to the other. This is almost to say that the allegedly humanistic and bridge-like role of translation was free of the specific ways in which languages operate in contested spaces of the Indian nation state. It is also to say that translation and the multilingual environment that it finds itself in India is indistinct enough not to require a discussion in tandem with the way languages get defined and contested. So one of the aims of this anthology is to foreground this connection. The contributors were invited to reflect, as I mentioned earlier, upon the idea of source in translation, a nucleus that stands most often unchallenged, sedentary and monolingual as it were. What is to encounter a source that is mobile and constituted in complex ways through different languages and registers? A set of issues open up in this book pointing to what Samira Sheikh and Francesca Orsini, and I'm, I'm drawing a lot from scholarship in India, which, is pre, which looks at pre-modern India. Uh, a set of issues that open up, open up in this book points to a hybrid, restless, multilingual, that nation-centered, monolingual scholarship has been unable to comprehend. Does translation emerge as an outcome of multilingualism or its precondition? Do we need to revisit translation as a corollary of the original or examine if it is not its constitutive force? In specific terms, does the idea of source, both as language and text, remain the unflinchingly sedentary institutions they have assumed to be in Anglo-American debates on translation? More fundamentally, does language definition and linguistic boundaries determine the existence of translation? And are they rhetorically constructed or based in everyday lives which continue to defy the institution of language? Going further, the relationship between India's linguistic pluralism and translation <clears throat> may appear to most as too obvious to merit a comment, leave alone a book. Don't all seminars, panel discussions, conferences, and books pay homage to translation by first foregrounding how linguistically diverse India is, and therefore how imperative it is to translate. But what are the particularities of this relationship? Is translation a testimony to the difference between languages or constitutive of one. When Urdu and Hindi are first separated through a set of historically constructed circumstances and then engaged through translation, what meaning does translation acquire in that context? Sundar Sarukai hints at something similar in the south of India. He says Tamil and Malayalam have a lot in common and if you know the Tamil script, you can decipher the Malayalam writing. Similarly, the scripts of Telugu and Kannada are quite similar. Ironically, for a nation where differences in language are the basis of creation of the states, and parenthetically of translation, it is also the similarity of these four dominant languages that unify these into South, as in South of India. So what does it mean to translate languages in contiguity compared with those in distant lands? And how do the familiar and the foreign play out in a society where both diversity and commonness compete 
sorry, yeah, compete to challenge existing epistemologies of the nation. On a more conceptual plane, how do we know what comes first, a language or translation? And do we agree with received notions of source, text, target after having examined what counts for such labels in the Indian context? Our experiences of translators or the underlying fragility of languages telling us something else. The phrase multilingual nation also marks an oddity. Nations are premised upon ideas of singularity of space, language, mission and vision. Modern nations were conceived as monolingual entities. Hence a multilingual nation is one that has still not sorted out what its main common national language is, making translation a politically potent site. Equally underserved is the concept of multilingualism in India. The word sits heavily, seldom found in common usage. Its contrived equivalents such as Bahubhashyata, which is what is used in India, also have a newness to them. I wish to explore elsewhere as to why that might be the case. For now, I wish to draw attention to the fact that multilingualism is invoked to express exceptionalism of Indian kind of nationalism without engaging with the concept of multilingualism. We witness in very recent times freshly theorized critiques of monolingualism and how it came to be constructed 19th century onwards. Think of Yasmin Yildiz, for instance. With regard to the European nations, this acknowledgement has come apropos interrogation of nationalism as one of the central questions in the social sciences today. Obvious though it may be, it is important to remind ourselves that translation theories in the West, as also its professionalization, emerge from the formation of the European nations and its consequent synonymies between languages and civilizations. The fundamental paradigm of a quote-unquote source in both language and text also arises from a certitude that boundaries of a language and text are definable and sealed and that translation as well as original compositions are necessarily in the written tradition. As far as India is concerned, contentious discussions have historically built around specific language, languages and their competing legitimacies rather than the place of multilingualism in a nation. Fundamentally, India did not see an oxymoronic relationship in a multilingual nation. The question was identifying the right symbols that did not take away pluralistic idea of language. Nonetheless, imperatives of Western modernity and nation making time and again prod certain technocratic imagination that looks for efficiency of a common language and sees many languages as a developmental burden. Responding perhaps to this is Indranath Chaudhary's earnest plea in an essay on translation and I believe some of these things I'm quoting were published in a meta volume that was that came out of here mm. some years ago. And Indranath Chaudhary says, and I'm quoting him, I need not emphasize that multilingualism is an all-pervading element in the Indian atmosphere affecting every aspect of the country's life. Whereas developed countries are perceived as monolingual states due to their tendency to become dominantly monolingual in a situation of monolingualism, the multilingualism of the entire third world is envisioned as problematic, particularly when developmental culture is viewed from the perspective of the developed world." Unquote. It is unclear why Chaudhary would conflate an economic category such as the third world with multilingual and monolingual developed world conflation as well. In any case, who's the interlocutor here? An abstract idea of the West whose gaze upon India's multi multiple languages makes Chaudhary defensive? Is that a failure of modernity or the full realization of nation? Such implicitly held questions have seldom found discussion Instead, a recurring moral claim attached with translation as the only bridge, if you like, or link or solution appears regularly since the last two decades. Chaudhary concludes the discussion on multilingualism by saying, and I'm quoting him again, 
translation is accepted as one of the ways of reconciling the interest of several of various groups, unquote. How did so much get invested in the idea of translation? And what is translation that does not get termed as such? How do transactions between different languages vary and adjust to make for some kind of quote-unquote translation? And how is translation itself a mode of distinguishing one language from another? A similar separation between language politics and translation, almost as if they had no mutually reinforcing role, characterizes Shanta Ramakrishnan's essay. And she says, in post-colonial India, officially recognized and supported translation, translation activities mediate between different linguistic group within the nation and seek to promote national unity and identity." Unquote. On the other hand, E. V. Ramakrishnan prepares us against such easy and smooth conclusions. He observes that translation studies as a discipline or as a discipline at the interface of disciplines is yet to be conceptualized with reference to our literary history. The political boundaries of linguistic states in India do not coincide with their cultural boundaries due to the complex history of social and cultural formations in India. This has meant that the translational discourses of the Indian subcontinent have been rendered unintelligible in our institutional climate of debates and dialogues. My next section is called Indeterminacy of Sameness and Difference. If, as Masika suggests, India is a linguistic area, and we later see in, you know, in the book, for instance, I have a chapter on G. A. Grierson, who did the first linguistic survey of India, and he talks about how the linguistic imaginary in India, he says, has these shading off of different languages rather than discreetly constituted sort of boundaries. Shudipto Kaviraj also alerts us to the dangers of treating languages as fully formed discrete entities and he says it is a world, to put it dramatically, of transitions rather than of boundaries. A sense of indeterminability echoed by Grierson. And yet Grierson is invoked each time you codify a language in India, uh, except for instance the Northeast and certain languages in the South, you invoke Grierson to codify that language. But Grierson himself talks about the indeterminability of distinguishing sometimes one language from another. Uh, so what is predicated upon the idea of sameness and, 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 and difference? And I think difference get, tends to get sort of overstated to, in order to sort of foreground translation. Do two languages, source and target, imagined to be the unshakable presences in the act of translation always have mutual incomprehensibility? There are enough examples that show not to be the case, just as there be enough examples that will show that is indeed the case. So I think this answer is a yes and no, the one of... Uh, there are enough examples that show that more difference may, la may exist within a language, say between 14th century Gujarati and modern day Gujarati, than between Gujarati and Marwadi. The institution of language is not a steady one. It breaks and crumbles under the questions raised by many forms of language pushed away for being non-standard, foreign, or dialectical. And the elements that do claim to rightfully, quote-unquote, belong to a language are also to be found in other languages. Recounting her experiences of travel with her brother, one of the contributors, Neelima Shukla Bhatt, who works on medieval Gujarat, and so she works on Meera and Narsi Mehta, who's a medieval saint. Uh, you would know Gan the famous bhajan that Mahatma Gandhi sort of promoted Vaishnava Janato Tehne Kaiye, which was by Narsi Mehta. So she works at these figures and she, sh she shows how the mobility of humans and languages change ever so slightly as to make the Gujarati saying or proverb Bar Gave Boli Badlai, which means the style of speaking changes every few miles. True, but only in a contextual sense. So let me just sort of clarify this a little bit. So you will have these everyday proverbs in many languages that talk about how every few steps languages change, right? Mm -hmm. 
uh, and the word that is invoked in India for language and dialect is pretty much the same. It's boli in many parts, which, which refers to both because it's, it does not make any difference between language and dialect. I attribute that actually to Grierson's Linguistic Survey of India. Uh, so you've got things like that, which says the language changes every few miles, but you also have people like Imanu and Masika who says India is a linguistic area, which means that there is, you do not have an unbroken chain of communication in any part. So you, it, it might be good to imagine these as colors on a shade card, so that there is a shading off. So you might have one color that is completely different from the color at the other end, and yet the intervening shades are one of sort of, uh, so it's good to imagine language that way. So she says in her Nilima Shukla's words, she says a language that sounded uh, completely different from where we started was eventually heard, but what we heard on the way was on a linguistic continuum with incremental changes from one block to the other. This may lead one to ask why translate at all, right? If the idea of translation is predicated on the idea of difference, then, and if things are on a linguistic spectrum, you might ask why translate at all? In a provocative article, Harish Trivedi argues that translation is the need of a monolingual world. It is necessary to translate, uh, and my sort of critique of Harish is built into, into what I go on to say. It is necessary to translate because tr a nation has many languages and contexts that need to communicate with each other. But when the so-called same language is in fact many languages forged together for homogenizing functions of the state, translation reveals the incomplete project of homogeneity. Translation is also, as I've discussed elsewhere, a desire for becoming, of self-fashioning, and speaking in languages that have a higher currency. And I'm saying this in the context of this article, Cast in a Castless Language, which I think, Sherry, you do, your curriculum uses it, right? In the, yes. Of a Dalit yes. wanting to speak yes. English, yeah. Yes. So I feel like instances are like those, Harish does not take account of. The translation is also part of this trying, wanting to become something else. Uh, Translation in India opens up myths of sameness and differences, revealing how similarities are but a wishful thinking, and differences come with a substratum of commonness. If, does not diff if this does not make translation unique enough, both as an epistemology and act, its relationship with linguistic economy of India is also highly complex. Languages comprehensible to each other get politically divided and sometimes incomprehensible ones get clubbed as one language. So for instance, let me give an example from uh, scholars who work in this room. Odia, for instance, would be comprehensible to Bengali. But it is not, the, the, there might be more difference between a contemporary Bengali and a medieval Bengali. So what sometimes gets clubbed together as one language may have more differences. In Gujarat, for instance, the region of Kutch, where I've done extensive work, Kutchi and Gujarati are incomprehensible to each other. And yet they club, get clubbed together for political reasons as being one state and one, one language. Uh, and sometimes you ha may have languages that are completely comprehensible to each other, but in order to mobilize a territory in its service, there, is, there are different language definitions sort of formed there. Uh, hegemonic languages shrink multilinguality while minor ones stretch themselves, sometimes to the point of relinquishing the places they come from. Complicating these crisscrossing relations that are both temporally and spatially, horizontally and vertically determined is the presence of English, a subject that demands its own treatment and yet never, as the case tends to be, without its relationship with other Indian languages. And I feel like although a lot of work in India goes on in the, in the arena of like English as, as a kind of an ideological instrument in colonialism or even, even in post-colonial <laughs> times, I think its relation with Indian languages and what happens to that particular la linguistic economy, those relations do not get sort of sufficiently studied or emphasized, especially in the context of translation. In the discussion that follows, some of the themes foregrounded above appear with respect to different contributions in the book, but they are not restricted to them. 
The thematic clusters are also drawn partly uh, with equal cognizance to the fact that there can be different ways of organizing themes. However, the questions that we seek to explore are the certitudes of language, source, text, and how they stand challenged, making the definition and ontology of translation suspect, and this remains a common thread. So my next section is called Glimpse into Pre-Modern Multilingualism. And in this section, we look at sort of devotional itinerants, migrants, Sufis, Bhakt, in, in, in that, that sort of time frame in India. And we look at, for instance, whether it is a Guru Nanak who travels from Punjab through Sindh to different parts of North India, or whether it is a Sufi from the area of Sindh who travels to different parts, or whether it is Meera or it is Narsi Mehta, you will find that their continued kind of appeal to different linguistic constituencies comes also from the fact that there are what, what in modern India come to be designated as different languages, they constitute their sort of address. Uh, so I'm quoting, for instance, from a Sufi writer or a Sufi poet from Sindh that I have worked on. His name is Shah Abdul Latif. And he sort of begins with this very, very well-known, which in Pakistan today stands as one of the sort of very interesting examples of a very syncretic period in the history of Pakistan. So Shah Abdul Latif's book begins with by saying, Awal Alha Alim Alha Alam Jodhani Kadir Penji Kudrat Asan Kaim Ahe Kadam and it goes on. But basically what these words mean is without beginning, without end, all-knowing monarch of the universe, omnipotent and benevolent, the one and only Lord, utter his name, sing his praises, the ever-compassionate creator of the cosmos. It is interesting it is largely, not entirely, the devotional and mystical that mixed languages of pre-modern India have stayed with us, reminding us of the monolingual imagination of our own times. Singing the praises of the divine often marks the beginning of a language. Interestingly, it is potentially an experience that is ineffable, but also one to have known to have reached many linguistic communities that we imagine in our modern world. The multiple languages such as Arabic, Sindhi, Siraiki, Punjabi, etc., that have gone into the message of the holy text Guru Granth Sahib, or the compilation of verses in Shah Abdul Latif's Risalo, which I quoted above, tell stories of multiplicities inadequately captured in the term multilingual. From the people of Sindh to the great run of Kutch in Gujarat and to Jaisalmer and Barmer in Rajasthan, the verses of Shah Abdul Latif, the famous Sufi saint from Sindh, traverses multiple worlds intersecting every now and then with what we now understand as Islam, Hinduism and Sikhism. Latif's verses are to be found among the African slaves or Siddhis brought to Gujarat, the Sodas and Mutwas and musician caste groups of Langas and Manganiyas in Rajasthan. So where does Shah Abdul Latif belong then? Kutch or Sindh? Right? What did these regions mean before the territorial boundaries were drawn? And what does it mean to translate Latif from quote-unquote Sindhi into Kutchi, uh, which are same language but not anymore for certain kinds of politics. These questions of mine find resonance in the contributor Neelima Shukla Bhatt's question below, emerging interestingly from the same region. And she says, what would be the language of the 16th century woman poet Meera, whose songs of devotion have been heard for century, centuries in the areas that constitutes Gujarat and Rajasthan states of contemporary India? Did she compose devotional lyrics in two languages? Were they translated? Meera was from an adjacent state of current Gujarat, but there was also the 15th century poet Saint Kabir of faraway Banaras, whose songs with profound spiritual messages are found in Gujarat with linguistic mix of Hindi and Gujarati in various degrees. When were they translated and by whom? If translation demonstrates, as Walter Benjamin tells us, the kinship of languages, how is translation predicated on difference? It is useful looking at 
Shukla Bhatt's observation that theories of translation are based on the presumption of a sizable divide between languages to which the two languages with which the translator works belongs. In the case of performative translations of devotional texts of medieval India, the extent of this foreignness is circumscribed by a number of factors within a zone of linguistic and cultural continuum a popular poet saint from one region is more likely to get integrated into cultures of other regions on the continuum through multiple forms of performative translation subsequently linda hess who's been a translator of kabir now for 40 years she says that even through a that if through a written paper the performative aspect of translation uh, is important and argues how studying text as oral, musical, performative, socially embedded and occurring in multimedia, multiple media can affect the way we translate. So this section was run largely to foreground this res what residual, if you like, crisscrossing or multi multilingualism that continues to obtain in mystical, devotional, Sufi and spiritual verses uh, which defy our modern notions of language and region today. Francesca Orsini in this volume has shown us how understanding of languages as individual possessions is derived from the present moment and serves the sharedness of repertoires that characterize preprint cultures badly. Through the utterance na turk na hindu which means neither Muslim nor Hindu shared widely in the religious sphere of North India among saints like Kabir, Ismailis like Peer Shams, Sufis like Malik Mohammad Jaisi and Bulle Shah, Frances Corsini provocatively argues for a fresh approach. She warns us against assuming that terms, idioms and stories quote-unquote belong to a certain linguistic community and if others use them, they are quote-unquote borrowing them. Invoking Bakhtin, who emphasizes upon the social and productive nature of the utterance, shared, accented, and re-accented by each speaker in constant dialogue with listeners and other speakers, I suggest that we read them, these utterances, as instances of re-accenting terms, phrases, characters, and stories, or even multi-accenting them if they sought to address different audiences at once. So even if the phrase remains the same, for instance, na na Hindu, which is a phrase that you'll find across different religious communities and different languages. So even if the phrase remains the same, the textual context within the song poems and perform performance context and location of the songs and their authors show that the phrase, that the phrase carried or produced. The fact that Orsini's deep and sustained engagement with multilingual cultures could only lead to an overhauling of certain given categories in translation studies is but natural, inevitable, and necessary. In terms of available scholarship on redefining one language, one script, one people, and making language the prism of seeing mixedness, Orsini has a pioneering role. Invoking Bakhtin and her own persuasively argued essay, she makes us revisit notions of language, text, and belonging attached to it with its attendant principle of discreteness and separateness. And then there is, so after this whole section on pre-modern multilingualism, then there is a section that looks at colonial technologies, codification of language in the 19th century, uh, and so on. And it's, it's a very discursive process in each language. For instance, if you have a Malayalam, what became standard Malayalam, how that was recast, out of the many available choices of sort of aligning standard Malayalam, although I don't talk about Malayalam here, I'm just giving these examples of the Malayalam that the high caste Nambudris would be using. In Gujarat, for instance, Grierson, whose linguistic survey of India was used to codify and Gujarat territory had to be carved out separate from Marathi. You had at the border of Gujarat where Marathi and Guj Gujarati overlapped in order to distinguish territories you had, you know, campaigners for Gujarati showing, oh, this is borrowed, these are loan words, these actually belong to Marathi, these belong to Gujarati. In the north, they did that with Marwadi. So these processes of linguistic codification, which were sort of, which gained a lot of strength 19th century onwards, this particular section, 
sort of talks about that. And in this section, and I'm just going to summarize a little bit so that it doesn't get too much and we don't run out of time. For instance, a scholar called, a doctoral scholar, which is at York, Sanjukta Dasgupta, she looks at the French experiment in Pondicherry, for instance. And she looks at French travelers in the 19th century and how did they make sense of the multilingualism they were encountering. So she looks at these travel accounts and so on. Uh, and then the section also has, for instance, a very well-known scholar, but again, who does not, is not traditionally seen as a translation study scholar. She works on sort of language politics. Her name is Veena Narigal, and she talks about how colonial pedagogy, texts, colonial texts, sort of mobilize idea of these different languages and in the process defined almost as if they had kind of no inherent relationship with each other but that they were kind of separately codified. Then another scholar who's again again known for her translation from Marathi but I don't know whether translation study scholars are familiar with her name. Her name is Rohini Mokashi Punekar and she sort of looks at Jyotiba Phule, a very well-known sort of a Maharashtrian thinker and how in his uh, in in his uh, dialogue with uh, colonial rule in Maharashtra he sort of draws from different registers of Marathi to complicate his address to uh, show that the Dalits have a different register of Marathi than the Brahminic Marathi and so on. Uh, so each of these Text really complicates the idea of this one language, right? <coughs> one single language or one single source. Uh, translation, as Mokashi Punekar persuasively demonstrates, was central to Fule's political position of a reimagination of caste community as an expansive category of the oppressed on one hand and transnational by its solidarity with slavery on the other. Fule's deployment of English, Marathi, and dialectical inflections at most unusual places, uh, at places the inseparability of linguistic translation from an identitarian one. Through both her analysis and translation, Mukashi Puneka details the political experiments on this text called Gulam Giri, Gulam is slave, and where Fule is creating the idea of, of Dalits are also like slaves. But he's drawing clearly from the example of slavery, uh, <coughs> African slavery on one hand and caste on the other. And the text itself becomes, in some sense, a very interesting sort of strategy of translation. Uh, so these ideas of different languages and different ideologies have become inseparable. But I think we seldom look at these multiple registers right, of different languages. We have a tendency to sort of think of language as being as the underlying kind of a steady static uh, notion <clears throat> and then I sort of then draw the next section sort of complicates the idea of mother tongue which there are other people also who've written about and I write about it in the context of my own work on Gujarati and so on uh, so uh, I'll sort of skip that. Then there are scholars who sort of look, who also look at the idea of minority language. Many papers in this volume points to ways by which translation and its relationship with language reproduce and reinforce scales of social hierarchies. For instance, a scholar called Somya Dechemma, who sort of works on, if you know the region of Kurg in Karnatak. So she looks at, for instance, the Kodavu. And the 18th and 19th century enumeration, classification, and realignment is an important background to what appears as a natural emotive charge to the idea of mother tongue. And you might also know, for instance, the very various metaphors which are used for mother tongues, an idea that gains much prominence in the 19th century. And the metaphors like Tamil Thai, like mother Tamil, or Telugu Abhiman, which means the pride of Telugu, Gujarati Gaurav, which means the pride of Gujarat, Konkani Mai, which means the mother Konkani, mothers, sisters, goddesses, evoking images of land, nation, and calling upon its male saviors to protect have created an iconography of languages. 
and you know very often when people in india talk about the importance of translation this they reinforce this importance of the mother tongue right because the mother tongues are important we must sort of do more translation but the whole sort of biological and emotive charge that is attached to this idea of mother tongue is not seen as a constructed one uh, because one is too busy sort of saying that how translation serves the cause of these mother tongues this creates language as essence of ethnicity and identity and this nationalism is important to the perception and experience of what is called mother tongues Nirav Patel this dalit writer whom i've cited in my earlier work goes on to show for instance how his gujarati which i spell with a small g not a capital g he says how his gujarati as a dalit is vastly different from the standard gujarati which i spell with a capital g so what is gujarati then or assamese or any other language for that matter does language formation sustain and survive on minoritization of alternative discourses several scholars asks this question and then there are others who point to this fragility of source making the relation of text and accuracy a western fantasy in a highly detailed analysis of the making of assamese language madhumita sen gupta who is a historian right she works on what is to become assamese and so she looks at the assamese and she draws attention to the fraught processes uh, of an assamese untouched by encounters with other cultures and how people came to be imagined uh so many papers for instance look at these examples of how in the making of assamese you have a hidden story of something called kamarupi which got marginalized in the making of kannada you might have other hidden forms of multiple registers that got uh, so this particular section looks at that my next section is called how stable are the sources situating her inquiry in the western same western region of india which is kutch gujarat Ma- uh, maharashtra krupa shah who is my doctoral student she demonstrates a world of narratives in which multiplicity is characterized both in terms of the constituent languages as well as the versions of the narratives themselves what does this multiplicity of telling and retellings of woven and interwoven narratives share with the manyness of languages in an indian context for instance if you look at for instance if you do a cartography through stories and through narratives and you see that how a particular story which we associate with let's say the small region called saurashtra in gujarat you will find in that what may be called the same story is claimed by sindh as being its own story and then you go to punjab and you've got another version of the story so if you look at the mobility of this particular narrative through these regions through what came to be constructed as different regions and different languages it really complicates you know some of the edifice upon which we all stand uh, so uh, her work does that in the western region and then you've got a creative writer called uh, mitra fukan who translates from assamese into english and again her work based on this particular region that overlaps what became bangladesh and what was and part of it is falls under assam and she looks at for instance a text she translates which is again constituted through certain kind of bangla and assamese and urdu all sort of mixed in this source text and yet the text gets sort of uh, promoted and projected as being a text belonging to this one linguistic constituency so she also sort of her essay problematizes this uh, so basically a lot of essays complicate what i mean foreground what bakhtin would call polyphony uh, and then there is this translator called trudeep surud who has translated a lot of very interesting 19th century literature he's a gandhian scholar and he looks at a very canonical gujarati uh, which paul may have heard of have you heard of saraswati chandra is almost the same time as uh, fakir mohan senapati he's that kind of a canonical writer govardhan ram tripathi like when you're looking at the first novel across different regions mm. so he translates that and he he also talks about how it is imbued with sanskrit and gujarati and kalidas and bhavbhuti and bhasha and so on uh, 
And yet, of course, when awards are given to translators, you'd say, oh, Tradeep Saroop is a translator from Gujarati. Let's give an award this time to Gujarati. You know? Uh, so, if a source text is destabilized by its own genealogy in multiple cultures, it is unlikely that target text can be effortlessly monolingual. Mini Chandran refers to target text created through English as a pivot language, hitting upon an anxious side to contemporary Indian society where all or at least urban forms of bilingualism mediate through English. Mini Chandran asks whether reflections of reflections, echoes of echoes, what do these translations of pivot language translations convey? Through details of several examples, including the stories of Mashweta Devi from Bangla to English to Malayalam, which Mini Chandran concludes is an example of the translator misled by the American flavor that Spivak has brought into the target text. Ironically, his fidelity to his source culminates in a treacherous translation with the source text rather than the translator becoming the traitor. Thus, all the mistakes in Joseph can be traced back which is in Malayalam, can be traced back to Spivak and not to Mashweta Devi, which prompts the question of how faithful regional language translations are to other regional language texts, and so on. So she eloquently concludes that the translated text in multilingual India is thus a dancer in a hall of mirrors. The multiple images makes it difficult to distinguish the reflection from the original. And yet we think of target text also in a very sort of a monolingual fashion. Another, another young scholar who actually works on urban cities, she cites Sherry, for instance, she looks at Ahmedabad as a city of translation. Uh, she expands the notion of text, source, and target, and even of language for us. Pooja Thomas, taking cue from contemporary scholarship on cities as zones of translation, uses Ahmedabad as a case study and translation as an active interpretative paradigm and as cultural practice in the city, it becomes particularly meaningful to the encounter with strangeness, outsidedness, and difference. Indian cities have, she argues, been the fulcrum of language movements, cultural and religious conflict, as well as been at the center of the debate around linguistic and regional identities in India. What is the negotiation that the Malayali diaspora does within the so-called Gujarati city of Ahmedabad? In this encounter with linguistic texts of a city, what processes of translation take place? What happened in the process to Malayalam and to Gujarati in Ahmedabad, as perhaps in other places where Malayalis migrated to? It mattered little, little that the person from Thrissur was practically incomprehensible to the person from Thiruvalla. Clearly accommodative practices of recognizing and acknowledging Malayalam in a city elsewhere stood at odds with the formal norms, norms prescribed by Sanskritized bureaucratic and literary Malayalam. In practice, Malayalam's definitive parameters had expanded to accommodate these new realities of speaking Malayalam elsewhere. Thomas substantiates vividly how the activation of the sedate noun multilingualism into a hectic verb a productive condition of translation. That, in fact, is translation, not an awaited consequence of the event, but the event itself. Uh, and then, for instance, I think I'll skip a couple of sections here. Uh, there's sort of, then I draw once again from other contemporary translations who also destabilize this notion of a single text and a single, for instance, as a very new translation of uh, this well-known Bhakt, again, like a poet, from Tamil, right, Andal, and a translation that looks at these different moments of Andal. So you've got two translators doing their Andal differently, mm -hmm. almost as if to say that each one of us claims our Kabir differently from the way you will claim Kabir, right? So there are, there are translations also which sort of complicate even the, the singleness of a target text now. As it happens in India as it happens elsewhere. Uh, and so I look at these various forms of telling and retelling and commentary and multiplicity of targets and text and so on. Uh, so 
when we think of text with the idea of fixity, the volume sort of tries to constantly unfix that. Uh, and in the process, sort of, I bring into this discussion Linda Hess, who I strongly recommend for Kabir translation. I think she does need to needs to be looked at. It's she sort of almost enacts the performative aspect of Kabir into the act of translation. And it's amazing how she manages to do it. Uh, so it's almost like a journey of a song rather than translation of a text which is embedded at a particular moment. Uh, so there is a kind of a limitlessness to the idea of Kabir and his travel through these various parts of North India and, and of Pakistan that she manages to capture through her essay, which has performance and music and ethnography built into that experience of translating Kabir over these 40 years. Uh, and yet in that idea of this mystical sort of a divine uh, world where you've got like a devotee seeking to become one with the seeker, almost as if you were, the word wants to meet another word and so on. Uh, I also look at, for instance, in that, in that context, I also look at how the whole idea of becoming one, of becoming, of this unification which is training into the very language of translation also then sort of shows us this non-duality of the text and the, of the source and the target. Uh, so for instance, the seeker also becomes the sought, achieving a complete union. Uh, and through a story which is very, again, well known in Sindh and parts of Punjab, a story called Sasui Punu, where this woman seeks her lover and goes through these difficult hardships. And in the end, she says, when I looked inside, I realized that he lay within me. And I became that person. I became the one that who was seeking, right? So breaking the binary also of what is, who is seeking what. The last section, uh, in the book and also in this introduction is called the time of translation and there are two very interesting scholars I bring here so one is uh, a scholar who's well known in another context I don't know whether he I think he's published that's he's also published in Meta Sundar Sarukai who trans talks about translation of mathematics and science and so on and he sort of disrupts the idea of time of translation breaking the chronology of what comes first and what comes after. Uh, and he, he sort of explores the possibility that translation as a concept is prior to the notion of language. The notion is, notion is provocative, giving rise to a series of anxious questions such as how are the authors defining language? What do they have to say about the myth of Babel? Yes. Admittedly, not central to our context, so central to, uh, to the discipline of translation studies. What is the conversation between this and Benjamin's idea of afterlife and so on? Uh, he sort of looks at not translation as a physical thing, but the notional idea of, of being from one text to another or one language to another as being prior to the actual act of uh, translation and certainly before the codification of language. So he sees, examines that relation in the context of Sanskrit and Kannada. Then you've got Ganesh Devi, a name that would be familiar to many of you here, who's also doing very interesting things. Drawing from his experience with the vast number and nature of Indian languages, Ganesh Devi provides a perspective that is rare and unsettling. He cites myths of writing in what we would see as entirely oral traditions. In this, Devi gently pushes us to rethink many definitions of writing, reading, speaking, painting. Is writing in the air? And he takes the example of this tri tribal community called Gondalis in Western Maharashtra, who have a certain myth of writing in the air. Uh, is that also writing? While speaking of another tribal community, Ratwas, Devi in his correct, characteristically gentle irony says, to my mind conditioned to think of language manifestation as either speech or writing, it seemed natural to infer that the paintings of the Ratwas were some kind of writing. The examples develop to break a pattern so common to human mind, the one of cause and consequence, before and after, prior and substantial. How do we wrap 
around our heads then the time of translation as to when does translation happen right devi reminds us that many of the oral traditions in india recognize a pre existent written or a simultaneity of the oral and the written challenging the historiography of writing that which is in letters or literature as temporally second to the oral when this cultural habit this negation of the gap between the preceding and the succeeding is carried to the hermeneutics of translation it opens up a question difficult to tackle furthermore he also shows how antecedence of the discursive nature of sequence inhabits the debate between and he cites from uh, ancient linguistics bharata hari and anand vardhana uh, and so on so i will sort of not go into that let me just come to the concluding part of that particular section so he devi's observations remind us of derrida who emphasizes the primacy in european culture of the grammatolo- grammatological of the written over the spoken however it would be fallacy to see this connection as simil- similitude between divergent context rather it uh, rather we suggest seeing it as an interesting conversation devi does not propose the primacy of one over the other instead he breaks the sequence of both and urges us to rethink the dimension of time altogether in translation studies so here are some of the closing thoughts one of the strands in the book in addition to others discussed all along has been to show how intertwined language definitions and translation discourses are and how might one situate the discourse of a source text in the act of translation yasmin yildiz quotes brian lenon who says that translations take the place of the encounter with other languages and therefore in some sense lessen multilingualism this in itself is odd considering as we saw in the earlier section translation is posited in india's discourses as a solution to multilingualism as as also an assurance of its persistence one of the ways of complicating this relation has been first to complicate the idea of language in this anthology and interrogate its already given and unitary status discussions on translations need to bring back language not as an empirical site but as one that informs our understanding of text and translation in particular ways as emily apter demonstrates in her book the translation zone the complex entanglement of languages with culture and politics demands such a focus on tensions struggles and language wars source texts and languages seen as natural products of mother tongues are challenged when we acknowledge their hybrid and protean nature it would seem then the very definition of translation in a multilingual society like india is suspect and this anthology is certainly not the first place where this suspicion is being articulated however this anthology allows this to come through a range of people from diverse context it has brought to board not merely translation studies scholars but practitioners creative writers historians philosophers political analysts and also scholars who speak from the specific context of their work uh, and disciplines and do not take for granted the cardinal assumptions of translation studies in fact a lot of my contributors don't know some of the theories of translation studies but i i sort of have not kind of tried try to orient them in the in order to achieve cohesion of a translation studies volume Contribu- contributors have not been expected to pay tribute to scholarship distinct distant from their worlds and projects translation is much too important and central to human communication to be restricted only to specialists and its integral relation with multiplicity of languages makes every per- person in south asia part of the process moreover some contributors have chosen to speak in a personal voice reflecting upon their relationship with languages texts and moments of translation and non translation some others have stayed within the conventions of social sciences and employed a register marked by polemics and distance an attempt to make this heteroglossia fit into a monolingual tone of anthology has not been made it goes against the spirit of the questions we have sought to ask it is important to recall bakhtin here once again whose concerns underlie many discussions in the book 
and he says philosophy of language linguistics and stylistics have all postulated a simple and unmediated relation of speaker to his unitary and singular quote unquote own language and have postulated as well as a simple realization of this language in the monologic utterance of the individual unquote meanwhile the thrust of making the relationship between multilingual texts and nations and translation active a mutually defining and contesting role in the anthology is an ongoing one there are others who have asked some of these questions and we may continue to do so epistemological and experiential worlds do not have neat meeting places thank you <laughs>